Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Welcome to the CTO Studio, man. Thanks, man. A good friend of mine said... Um, Good habits beget good habits. Which friend? His name is Mick. Okay. I don't think he came up with it, but he reminded me of it. Yeah, I feel like and habits the point, are pretty much everything. And the point that he was making was, if you can start the day with good habits, then you're creating good habits for the rest of the day. If you're starting bad habits early, then basically you're just begetting bad habits. For the rest of the day. I'm 100% in on that. Have you read uh, Make Your Bed in the Morning or whatever that book's called? It's kind of about that. The Navy SEAL guy who makes his bed every morning because it's at least you've accomplished <laughs> something. It's a picture book. <laughs> it's a Navy <laughs> SEAL guy who makes his bed every morning. Is that? I feel like there's a bunch of cliches in there. He's a national known speaker, apparently. So, like, you just got to stick with the principle like that, give an example. And I do. Do you believe in self affirmations? Like, to say good things about yourself to no. your brain? No. Don't you think your brain should hear good things come out of its mouth? Probably. But I feel too weird when I do it. But, yeah. I, I like, say it in my head. It, all day anyways, right? Like randomly to encourage yourself. But so one of the problems I have in life is I can feel pretty lonely very quickly. And then I feel it kind of fuels bad habits like maybe emotional eating or just being short with someone. Mm -hmm. And I have, so we both are fans of Morning Miracle. Yeah. Miracle Morning. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I started saying to myself is, Etienne, you are connected to people. And when I say that, I, can, I almost feel a sensation in my shoulders. Yes, it's weird, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm, wow, okay, I'm connected. I am connected. I'm not pursuing it. I'm not hoping for it. I'm not trying to nurture it. I just am connected. How many days did you do affirmations before you felt that way? I still don't feel that way. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, so you're on the same page then. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean it's it's the weirdness the weirdness continues but I I I do believe in it. Okay, so in miracle mornings in terms of self affirmations, I get more out of writing things down. That was the highest impact of the six activities. So I felt like it was nice he lets you customize it cuz then there's no pressure to do something that makes you feel weird or I've never I think books are helpful, but I think when I talk to people that I view as successful in their own way, like then I'll buy in on whatever it is. So like an example would be like bulletproof coffee, right? Like I've heard about it, I've read about it, but not until somebody tells me that it works for them will I try it. So like affirmations, I've never heard a successful person that I know and respect in outside of a book say affirmations work. That was the key. But I've heard a lot say journaling and a lot say mm -hmm. reading mm -hmm. and a lot say meditating and or praying yeah. from the six activities in the book. So I just gravitate towards uh, those three. Yeah, it's the power of the referral, right? Right. If, if, if a friend says you should go eat at this place, then then I'm more inclined to do that right. than to read some Yelp review from some stranger that said that the chicken wings were incredible. 100%. The, at least that's how I work. Yeah. I think Anyways. that's how the human, the human needs that. So as an entrepreneur, what do you need to do to feel good about th your day? Um, like how, do you, how do you keep going in the face of adversity, P&Ls, no's, churn? I think a lot of it's, there's two parts. One you kind of already touched on, though, is starting the day out. Because if you start the day out bad, if I was just getting to the office... And this is a new habit for me, so I'm not an expert in this. But uh, 
getting to the office super early and just knocking out. This is probably, well, is this a good time to tell the like, how the 4.30 thing, like the 4.30 habits it. type thing? So uh, I felt like one of the things we talk to the students about all the time is like successful habits are, are pretty much the core of everything that you do, right? So like um, if you boil it down to like the simplest thing, it's just like what habits do you have every day in terms of like what's the outcome that you're going to reach in tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, et cetera. So I kind of wanted to like personally challenge myself um, by getting up super early. So like 4.30 was early for me. And so I just knew I had to do it for a month, essentially. And so um, I feel like waking up at 4.30 and for the last, it's been probably six weeks now, it's been the only time in the three years of the business that I've been consistently at email inbox zero at the end of each week and where I've planned out all my days, all my meetings, et cetera. And so like, I think one thing that like, for me personally, that's helped throughout the entire, you know, two and a half, three years with Origin has just been knowing that nothing happens right away, right? So like you have to allow yourself to fail mentally because you're typically you're, you're your own biggest critic, right? Like, so there's nothing anyone could tell me about uh, being critical of me that I haven't probably already told myself and been like 10 times harder on myself about. And so I feel like for from that angle, like, it's just like, you have to allow like one day I woke up at 6.30, right? And like totally slept through my alarm or made a conscious decision to just sleep in that day. But you have to know that that's okay. You're never going to reach perfection, but you have to be able to like make progress each day essentially. And so it's, you know, I see it all the time because I'm in a, a weird business in that way and that I see psychologically in a classroom all of the, and like typically people will fail or they won't be able to finish something. And for me, there's always something that's breaking. And so, or a process that's broken, or we haven't followed through on something. And I think as long as you can forgive yourself and know that that's part of the process of getting to where you go and kind of identifying, taking 15 minutes to like be hard on yourself and then just moving on, then it really helps you get through the day because it's really just part of the process. It's just that like the one thing I repeat in my head all the time is just as long as you don't give up, you'll win, right? Like, because historically speaking, and again, I know it's a, like I say it all the time to the students, right? Like if I gave you a hundred years, could you learn how to code? All every anybody can learn how to code in a hundred years, right? So like, then I cut it in half to kind of make a point about like 50 years, 25, and then down to like, okay, so you think you could do it in a year, right? Like, yeah. What about under a year? Probably. All right, well, let's do it, right? Like, but you're not going to get there if you give up. So I feel like, you know, giving up's kind of the, uh, as long as you don't do that, you're good to go. And you know, uh, to kind of tie it into self-affirmation. Yeah. It's a f- t- that's to me where it's a form of affirmation where it's like, listen, contrary to what everything inside of me is feeling right now, I, I cut that off with this statement. And like you're saying, you will carry on because if you do not give up, you will succeed. Yeah. So to me, that's the affirmation that part of, of the day or of the, of the moment where you're just like, I refuse to take in whatever's being shown me by this world, i.e. you're not going to make it or, and I just like, I, I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. I, I feel like that's what my self affirmation would be then is I, I do tell myself in my head, as long as you don't give up, yeah. you'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the journey I feel like I'm on a little bit, which is how can I, how can I not be who the, my environment is telling me to be and just, just be aspirationally the thing that, that I'm moving towards. So it's like, it's not being like, oh, I am successful. I am a millionaire or I blah, blah, blah. No, there's none of that that even happens in the process. No, (laughs) (laughs) no, but I think it's that conscious choice to be, you know, optimistic and to be. So Aaron Fulkerson gave me a line that I'll probably steal for the rest of my life and that your job as a CEO of a small business, large business, whatever, is just to be pathologically optimistic. 
And so I've repeated that phrase and thought that phrase in my head all the time. And it's easier if it comes natural, which it does. But like, there are always moments where you have to remind yourself. And so uh, as CTOs, um, we're oftentimes pathologically skeptical. Correct. And so I, I, I'm really drawn to the, the, the reframe as, you know, what happens if I design this system, develop this person with, with optimism? Like, I'm optimistic that this person will uh, do well, that this architecture will scale. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a fresh and a light feeling. Yeah, I mean... Software breaks all the time. It's the only thing that gets in that way. <laughs> it's just like, Software I sucks. would be a little more pessimistic if I had to build software every day. <laughs> yeah, but I know I, I can turn around people, right? Like, because that's just their, that's just their mindset. Well, I think that, I think that the, um, when it comes, to, and it's interesting, I think when it comes to estimations and can this be done, I do actually think that software developers are a little too optimistic sometimes, where it's like, oh, yeah, no, it's, I'll have it done next week, or, yeah, sure, not a problem. Uh, yeah, I can solve these problems, but then really you can't solve the problem, or, and then you aren't really in touch with that sort of reality. But um, let's move to OriginCodeAcademy.com. Okay. Jeff Winkler, CEO and founder, co-founder of, of Origin. Both. So you're the founder and the co-founder. All of the above. So you're basically your own co-founder. Yeah, it was basically me and Cameron that uh, had started it. So co-founder is probably more okay, appropriate. Okay, cool. Oh, so Cameron was, was there in the mm-hmm. beginning? He was. Oh, okay. I he made our that. first curriculum. Okay. I thought he was a hired gun. No, no. Oh, okay. Well, I found him afterward, after the idea. So you founded Origin, brought in Cameron. Said the only thing that's missing, technical co-founder. Then we found Cameron through a friend referral. Okay, and was it basically you? It was you hit the ground running. Great relationship. And, yeah, and I mean Cameron's still around, so it's a it's a beautiful thing. He's not around. Oh, he's like freelancing, and he'll be back. And like he needed a break from startup land. <laughs> Eric, uh, I should make better notes next time. <laughs> Uh, so origin. I mean, he'll be back yes, for yes, sure. Yes, no. he just, he's, he's on the planet. He's just doing other things. He's down the street, just yeah. freelance and living the dream. Uh, the Origin Code Academy started as a dream to to throw your hat into the coding boot boot camp code school arena. Mm-hmm. Um, in a world filled with these types of schools, what? Why did you decide to 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 give a go at this? So the I'd started an app previously with a developer I found off Craigslist. And then we ended up selling that to uh, ClassPass, essentially. And so then I didn't want to give up ownership in the next company if I didn't have to. And I felt like I could raise money if I built an MVP with revenue or users traction. And so to get a prototype built, though, was between 20 and 50 grand, depending on like who I talked to to get a prototype built. And then these coding boot camps like, just come out. They're probably like a year old. And so... I was like, why don't I just pay $12,000 to teach myself how to code and then build the MVP? Because it didn't have to be great. It just had to be good. And so I went, it seemed like a deal to me. So I went into the class. I was the kind of the only one in my class that had this plan to build an MVP to start a company. Everybody else was kind of like jobs. I need, I want another job. I want to change careers. And then afterwards, nobody got a job. They were all really upset. I'm just a naturally curious person, so I went on an interview myself, and then they gave me a code test, and I didn't even know a code test was part of the application process, and so not to mention like actually walk them through the logic of how it was going. So I just started talking to them about how good I was at biz dev and sales, <laughs> and said, tried to say like, hey, if I if I do well in sales, can I like code on the side, and you guys like teach me how to code? And they were like, no way. So. So apparently I'm not that good at sales. So the uh, so then I had talked to uh, one of the investors that had talked to asked me what I was working on next, and so kind of explained to him how everybody was upset about the boot camp, and he's like, "You sound pretty upset. Why don't you just fix that?" And I thought, "Yeah, okay, I could." My first thought was actually like, software scales fairly simply for sake of argument, and 
schools don't scale, right? You have to get a building, you have to train teachers. Like, so initially I was like, man, that sounds like a lot of work. So and he's like, you sound really mad though. And so that was kind of how that started. So what we said was we're going to go down this path until we hit a barrier that seems like too big. And so flew to San Diego because I had lived here before and there was no competition here at the time. And so went to a couple of co-working spaces. Um, James Martin was actually the very first person we ran into in San Diego at uh, Co-Merge. And just, Close friend of mine. Yeah, just asked him if we, uh, is, does this city need more developers or do you feel like they're good? And he's like, oh no. And then he explained there was a code school here. They just started their first class and San Diego could definitely use more talent. I think him and I, was it when him and I just hired three yeah. students from a, from a code school? Yeah, it was right like the following week from that that I like randomly showed up here for the day. And we went to co-merge and a couple of the union co-workers and went to a bunch of co-working spaces and just asked people if they needed developers. And then me and Cameron essentially uh, figured out and negotiated for one classroom that was uh, about the size of my office now and then kind of just went from there essentially. And that was how many years ago? Uh, it'll be three years in June. And you've graduated how many... Uh uh, we've gotten 105 or 106 people jobs in San Diego so far. And uh, I think that's out of like 125, 126. Really? So yeah. basically 90% success. I think it's closer to 80, but I don't, it's, I should have done the math ahead of time. But me yeah. Too, me too. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and uh, from what I remember, you guys picked a stack, um, dot .net. Yeah, we, we started with uh, Angular and C Sharp was the first full stack that we went. Um, today we do React Node. Um, and so it seems like every six months or so we change our tech stack to kind of correlate to, it was kind of a learning I had when I actually went to a code school was um, that I, I learned Ruby on Rails. And so like the code school I went to in Florida um, had kind of like scaled from San Francisco. And so they just took whatever curriculum was was prevalent there and so it wasn't that there was anything wrong with ruby on rails it was just there were no jobs for that particular language and employers didn't want to take a risk on like oh we'll just teach you another language before you even have any experience so we felt like it was important to just match whatever the employers were looking for so we've kind of switched every i would it used to be every quarter but react seems to be pretty popular at the moment and are you also doing react native uh, some people will do that on their final projects. And, um, um, do you, do you, do you consider yourself a school or are you a recruiting agency? School. And, but, but you are promising people jobs, right? Yeah. I don't promise people jobs. I tell them I'm not going to give up on you. So I'll meet with you every week until you get a job. The only reason that our students don't get a job is because I can't get them, I can't have them return my phone call when we're like, hey, how's it going this week? Like, they won't show up for the meeting. They'll kind of, you know, get discouraged. So I feel like we're definitely a school because there's more of a psychological component to like, mm. just letting you know, like, you can actually be successful if you've never seen success in your life and don't like have family and friends around that may have not seen success either. So it it's much more school than... Yeah. recruitment agency at least today on the point of seeing success i would like to just tell you about two things one whenever i go play golf uh and you do sort of the warm-up yeah and you go to the green and you start trying to putt these you know 20 foot putts my brother-in-law once said to me spend that 15 minutes sinking one foot putt because the feeling of succeeding at putting, you know, nailing, you know, 50 putts far outweighs than, you know, the 49 putts that you're going to miss and then sinking the one before, you're, before you go out on the golf course. Yeah. I thought that was pretty powerful. 100%. There's actually a golfer that does that. Oh. He starts with, uh, and then there's some basketball players that'll start with layups. Oh, okay. And then like scoot back okay, like okay. two to three feet each time to kind of get those big wins. Okay. Yeah. And that's the thing is like when they come into the class, like we have to get you a big win like as soon as possible because you just need to know that you can succeed unless you give up. Right. 
So it's it's more and more about getting people big wins where when we started, it was more about like, we have to have the best curriculum on the planet, like end of story. Mm. And like, you kind of get to the employer placement and the employer like obviously needs them to know how to code. That's what they're going to be doing each day. But it's again, it's more about their habits. Like, mm. hey, can I rely on this person? Are they a natural problem solver? Will they take it on? When they come ask me a question, you want to know in your brain that you, you already know they've exhausted every resource anywhere that they have versus somebody that comes and asks you every 10 minutes, like, you know, hey, I can't figure this out. So do you find that uh, at Origin, it's, it's becoming less about the coding curriculum and more about these other soft skills? I would say it's always been true. We're just more aware of it now. So now it's more of like a, I'll give you an example from the last 30 days. So there's an employer up in Encinitas that just hired our student. So I said, he came to the classroom two weeks, or I'm sorry, last Thursday for the job fair. So I was like, hey, how's he doing on his first two weeks on the job? And he said, oh man, he's the best because he bothers, he never bothers me, right? So like all of these other people will come and ask all the, like, hey, I can't figure this out. Hey, I can't do this. I know when he comes and asks me a question, he's, he's exhausted every single thing under the sun to be able to solve this problem. And so like, I want to take more time and like help work with him because of the fact that, you know, he asks intelligent questions, essentially. So he has like a successful habit and a successful process, right? That's like, ultimately, he'll be successful. And, and that he, do you think he came into Origin with that? Or do you think he... He definitely did not. Wow. I mean, <laughs> so no. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this, you know who you are. He does, he does. Okay. Um, the second thing I want to tell you about is I started playing chess with my nine-year-old son. Yeah. Um, and have you always played chess or just I was, I've always played chess okay, all right. I've always loved chess uh, and of course being a dad to my newly formed human crushing him in chess is just brings me so much joy because I can just it's not about if I'm going to win it's like how quickly can I crush him do you try to win slower to teach him lessons no no I try oh, okay. to crush him as quickly as possible um, but I then noticed <laughs> Is that cool, Eric? I have so many ancillary thoughts, but I'll... Uh, then I started <laughs> noticing that he didn't want to play anymore. Yeah. It's weird, right? Which <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was kind of sad about that. It's um, like if you played basketball with Shaq, right? Like, how many games are you going to play before you're like, I'm good. I think I know the <laughs> result of this game. <laughs> so anyways, um, so we went on a little summer vacation, uh, spring break vacation, and I was able to lure the poor animal back to <laughs> the slaughterhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and I chose to, um, and, I, and, and I made it more about, hey, let's see if we can play a game of chess every day and more about that than the actual game. 100%. Anyways, I then continued with the crush, uh, but he stuck to our agreement of playing every day. Then I realized that maybe I should take all my pieces off the, uh, off, like if, we're, if he's black and I'm white, I take off all my pieces and I just have a king and a pawn. Mm -hmm. And then I say, come, come, come have at it. Now I know I'm going to lose, right? Yeah. You can't believe the change in disposition because he, he used to be incredibly defensive. And so I would just destroy him, okay? And then I told him, no, be more offensive. The best uh, defense is off, blah, blah, blah. He didn't understand any of that. But when he saw that I just had these two little pieces, he came out guns blazing. And he knew success was possible. Yes, and so he started crushing me. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I'm thrilled that um, he, his whole game, his, everything about his game changed. Yeah. And so I told him, my plan now is to, as he wins and as we go through this, I'll just start adding my third and fourth and fifth pieces. And then hopefully I'm now building up resistance. But kind of to the golfing analogy, I think I, I cannot begin to describe his, his confidence, his just having felt that big win. Not once did he even say, oh, yes, I beat you, but you know what? It was because you only had two pieces. No, it was like I crushed you. And I think that just as a kind of riffing on that, that, that feeling of success, I think that this could be the gateway for him to becoming a great chess player. How many pieces do you need to beat him? 
I don't know just yet. Just out of curiosity. I don't know. I haven't done just, the math. Oh, okay. I probably, if I get up to about five or six pieces, I could probably start um, outwitting him. Go to queen and two rooks. I feel like you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then just my uh, disappointment in myself with my bias towards asking my son to play chess and not my daughter's. You know what's, <laughs> you know what's interesting? I'm not going to. Not going to go there. Mm-mm. Okay. Well, I want to get better as a parent and I hate my gender bias. I support you in that decision. Thank you. <laughs> So in the, but back to the chess thing, you know, what's interesting too is you kind of take for granted that like, if I want to go get a job for me personally, I just like show up to that place and like not bother. I call it persistence. Some people would call it bother the owner of that business or the hiring manager until I can convey the value that I'm going to add to that business. Right. And that's just like a conceptual thing that I've always done. I wanted to I've always randomly emailed strangers that I respected that were much more successful in some aspect and just set up like every month. I just email them until they meet with me. And so like typically takes between 18 and 24 months to get a response. But like typically those people really appreciate because nobody does that, right? Like nobody follows up that often. So like, but that's what I've just been doing like my whole life for, because somebody probably taught me that. And so I kind of take for granted Sometimes our teachers will take for granted, like when you're sitting with your son playing chess and like you just are like, well, this is so obvious. Like, how does he not know I'm about to crush him? Right. And so, but you kind of take that for granted in a way. And so what's super interesting is like, I guess an analogy would be like taping that game and like describing to him, like watching the video back with him and like flipping the board around your side and asking like what he sees and then like walking them through like your mindset. Like, here's what I was trying to do. I was trying to kind of like isolate your king over on this side. I knew if I put this, this in here, like there was no way that like you weren't even paying attention to this right now. Mm. Like you didn't even see it coming. Mm. Right. And so I feel like that's been super helpful is not assuming that somebody thinks the same way that you do. And like, you're just mapping it out and explaining to them I feel like the best way to do that is with questions too, right? Like just, you know, what do you think I'm going to do next? Why am I going to do that? What would you have done next? Oh, that's super curious. Like what consequence would that have had, right? Like, and a lot of times like people are, when it's your son, it's different because you have a different relationship with your son than like teachers and students. But a lot of times too, what's interesting is people always give like the surface level answer the Mm. first time, right? Like what would you have done? Well, I don't know. I'm just a student. And you're just like, okay, yeah. well, if you did know what to do, yes. like, but pretend like you know everything. Yeah, then what would you yeah. have done? And then they're like open to, like, they need to know that you're not going to be judging them, that you're literally just like coaching them to. Can you tell, uh, can you tell on day one from your co, the cohort that comes in to obviously learn how to code, which, which ones are going to be the stars? No. I can tell after a week when I've seen their work ethic. Work so, ethic. Yeah. 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 Not like you've seen what they've learned or how they've coded. No. It's all about their work ethic. I have not sat in the classroom for a whole day for the entire time that everybody in the classroom right now has been in there. But I am typically the first one in and usually like the night class is there, so I'm not usually the last one out. But the but just in my walking through the classroom twice a day, like or like when I need to use the restroom walking through the classroom, I can pretty much anecdotally tell you who's going to get a job first and and then of course it gets without uh, even talking to them yes and then does it and and then have you seen that the proof oh yeah yeah because amazing me me and cameron used to have all these like we didn't actually bet anything but almost like prideful bets of like oh this person's gonna get a job first then it's gonna go this 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 and usually based off technical experience or like oh they've worked they've been a consultant as a project manager seems like they'd fit together they're crushing it in the class all of a sudden somebody who's willing to go to a meetup and like put themselves out there or like cold email employers will get a job first, even though he's not nearly as technically strong as uh, like other people in the class. So it's, it's almost always the people that are, I mean, we have a student there right now. We all knew he's going to get a job fairly quickly. He's graduated in three weeks and he got himself a job yesterday. Right. But like we kind of knew that, like yeah. I went to the LA um, tech fair that the mayor runs 250 tech companies there he was the only student 
that went up there. And so like when I got there, he was uh, the first time I saw him, he was like shaking hands with employers, like just going around like the line. And he was in like week three of our class. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. and so, you know, people will say, well, like, you know, it's week three. I just want to learn how to code. Like that's not necessary. Like it's too early to be doing that. And in some regards it is, but it's more of like the mindset yeah, of the just mindset. like, oh man, I see an opportunity. Let's go. And he didn't even get a job from the LA tech fair. So you could argue that was a waste of time. Right. But it's, it wasn't because it was the habit of like introducing himself of like. And that's something that he came into origin with. It's not something. He did. Yeah. 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 That one we did not Do you have some secret sauce where you're teaching your students how to be more hireable? I don't. I would say the short answer is it's not a secret. It's more of just like the accountability and like. People always ask me what our competitive advantage is. And I always like, it sounds so cheesy, at least to me, but it's just that we care, right? Like, so everybody on our team, you know, I always say like the instructors could make more money coding somewhere than they could teaching in our classroom, right? But they care. So like, you know, it's not that like rare to see an instructor in the classroom till 11 o'clock at night helping students whiteboard, like in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, because like the students will ask for that help and then like the, the instructors are there to help students get jobs, right? And so I feel like that's really the only secret is just yeah. the, like, we'll meet with you every week until you get a job. Like, you're going to give up on yourself, but we're never going to give <laughs> up me, on you. Let me ask you, um, are you, are, are you in conversations with CTOs about uh, hiring your, your graduates? Yeah, I mean... And typically those conversations are like reach outs of like, are you guys hiring? What are you looking for? Um, so, I mean, if I could boil it down to like, I always tell the students, there's three things that I feel like all CTOs are looking for. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Oh man. Uh, first one is problem solving. So they're a good problem solver. Second one is collaboration. And then the third one is like hunger or work ethic. And so um, I would put curious under the problem solving tab. And so I feel like if you have a combination of those three things, right, and there's like the problem solving is just you're naturally curious. Why did that break? What's going on? How can we solve this problem in an intuitive way? Or also like maybe it's not web development, but you could just as easily get a job by building a skill in Alexa and talking about it in an interview of like, oh, I was just curious how the skill thing worked and I put it all together. And so like, here, talk to the Alexa, right? Like you're probably going to get hired for that over your peers because nobody else is doing that. They're all building web development projects. And so that's kind of like the curious problem solving tab. And then collaborations kind of like the like don't be an a-hole kind of, you know, deal where it's like, you know, and I've actually heard you say this to the students before, and I repeat it all the time actually, is uh you can you can make really good money as a software engineer in today's world, but you're gonna cap out at like insert average number here essentially. But if you want to make that number times two, times three, times 10, you will never accomplish that unless you make it a habit of making those around you better, right? And so that's kind of like the collaboration tool where it's like, there's just so much strong opinions and like, hey, you know, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm just going to do my thing in a silo. But if you can't like work on a team and like, you know, nobody wants to work with you. And so, and then lastly, it's just work ethic of like, you know, you just got to get the work. Deal. It's just an effort. And it's interesting for me that all three of those points are none of it's really. Uh, you don't have to be born with that as uh, in your baked into your character. These are all three things, except maybe for work ethic. Um, but these are all three things that you can learn. Correct. I think you can wor learn work ethic too, um, in the sense that you just need some accountability and you, you need like the classic Simon Sinek like you need your why right like if you don't have something that's if you're just doing it to get a job like people know mm. and you know mm. so you're not going to put in the effort do you um so what what are CTOs or hiring managers number one or two objections to bringing in a code school grad um that's a good question what are the biggest objections a lot of times um, it's, if you can afford it and you need to move fast, you hire senior engineers. So if they can afford it, 
which typically falls in like the big company category, and they have a mission critical project, then they're not going to hire students. And so um, I would say that was a, a large problem before was I want senior engineers. I don't have time to train juniors. And so I would feel like categorically most CTOs feel that way, not to generalize, but they do. And so um, part of it, what we do, the reason what we do works is because they don't have a choice to a degree. If you're like a smaller, medium-sized business and you have to compete against, like you don't have to compete against this necessarily in San Diego, but like the Googles or like Amazons or like, you know, they can make a lot of money working there, right? So like you should have some kind of plan to have a talent pipeline and they can't afford to overpay and compete for this talent on like a dollar for dollar basis. And so, you know, some go culture route and have like the snack walls and like the dogs in the office stuff, which there's nothing wrong with. Um, It's more of just like a, how are you going to attract talent? And every company I think needs a plan for that um, because there's just not enough seniors to go around right now. So that's, that's one objection. I would say the other objection is um, if they've ever hired a boot camp student that has not done well, then they kind yeah. of throw the baby out Jaded, with yeah. the bathwater. And so um, one thing for me personally is, and you know this, because is like we have the employers reach out to us directly and kind of give those uh, referrals based on those three criteria. Of, and it matters too if you're like, hey, this this position is customer facing or this position isn't customer facing. I just need them to like get knockout projects, knockout tickets, like, and those are two very different people. But I feel like we can help add value to like the employer side of it by kind of like helping like guide, like I need three candidates, they're customer facing. It's going to be just completely HTML, CSS landing pages. And like, I just want to, somebody that I'm going to be able to hang out with and have fun with. Right. Or what's the most typical thing is after they've hired a student, they're like, I need another ETN. I need another Jeff. I need another Mm. like so-and-so. And And I'm just like, oh, I know exactly who that is. So that's like more typically how that conversation goes. And then that, and then really what starts happening there is these tech companies, CTOs are starting to build a relationship with you or with Origin, the brand. Right. Where they can say, okay, out of the 10 hires I've made, eight were great, two were duds. Um, but, you know, when I need someone, I call Jeff. Right. You know, and I, uh, uh, I have quite a bit of experience hiring bootcamp grads. And, um, uh, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing if you think through what does it mean when someone becomes a senior dev? Like, what does that really mean? You know, it's... it's uh, and it, it's really just experience and knowing that someone isn't going to uh, – someone. it's almost like when there's wide open spaces, they know what they, – they, they're going to know what to do. Right. I feel like I've thought about that a lot too in terms of like what's the difference between a junior, a mid-level, and a senior? And I feel like it's literally just confidence. And like in some situations, it's literally, you know what? I'm going to call myself a mid-level developer. And I'm going to go get a mid-level developer job and you apply for a mid-level title and then you get it and then you're solving harder problems. But it is super interesting that there's no, it's somewhat arbitrary of like. A little bit. Yeah. Cause I, I, I'm on a, I, I, you know, I, sometimes I'm in a team, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like a leadership team and then they'll say to me, oh, it's time for us to start hiring senior engineers. And I'm like, do you know what you're saying? You know, first of all, don't tell me who I need to hire. Right. <laughs> but secondly, um, which that's my own personal problem. But secondly, it's like there seems to be this value attached to seniority. It's like senior vice president. Sure. But I will say that, um, uh, and it's potentially the counter to this that might actually happen. When I've seen with bootcamp grads that if, if there's a problem they cannot solve, many times they um, they freak out, whether it's on the outside or the inside. Yeah, it's like you know what? I tried. I tried A, it didn't work. I tried B, it didn't work. I tried C, it didn't work. 
and then it, and then the outcome there's an assumption that then rests on it oh it's got to be this third party plugin or well i looked over the code a million times and i think the senior or the more experienced person is going to ask is going to is not going to make the types of assumptions that a junior will make and i think that's what experience brings so right and you actually told me that i remember a lot of what you told me wow yeah scary right <laughs> you're like scanning through your brain right now <laughs> so um i use this analogy all the time with the students and i stole it part of it from you and then added the part that i think would relate best to them so what is the difference i tell them this on day one is what is the difference between elon musk when he solves problems and you right and so you i don't remember what words exactly used but i remember the concept very clearly of like when you're a senior engineer whatever that looks like and i use elon musk because he's the easiest person to use that everybody knows and so he's trying to put rockets on mars right so like when you ask him how he's going to do that he doesn't know right like or he says the technology is not available like he's still trying to process all of that and like the self-driving cars with Tesla, right? He doesn't know how to do that or it'd be done right now necessarily. He doesn't have every single piece figured it out, but he also isn't sitting at home on his couch like that's not possible. And so what happens is somebody, or he decides in his mind, I'm gonna build a rocket ship to Mars. And in his mind, he just thinks, I haven't solved that yet, but I've solved some pretty hard problems. So I'm sure I can figure it out, right? The same thing happens the first day at the code school where they just think, only it's emotionally handled very different. And so what you said was like, every engineer has this place like right here where they're just like, oh shit, I cannot solve this problem. I'm screwed, right? And so, but what happens is every time you solve a hard problem and you just need to go through those reps, that gets like a little bit less intense every time you solve a hard problem until eventually you think, I'm gonna build a rocket to go to Mars and you barely feel anything, but you definitely still think, I wonder if I can do that but you don't freak out anymore because it's been so numbed Yes. because you already know because you can you do it. Put that back. Right. So I feel like that's kind of like the biggest difference is like, I'm going to call myself a mid-level engineer. I'm going to call myself a senior because there's no problem that I have that I'm freaking out. And I'm like, that's not possible. Yes. And I think that to, 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 to just kind of button that point, Yep. the, um, uh, when there seems to be a problem that you, that the junior cannot solve, if they don't have that curiosity really about, uh, if they don't question themselves, it's like the the que I think the senior the questions go really deep, right? Whereas with the junior yeah. the questions are just maybe surface level, and the the senior knows to ask questions. And and if they don't know the answer, they ask a different question. Yes, and and, and whereas the, the junior gets to a dead end and, and they're it, like life is over exactly it's done there's no more questions and then that brings you to the second <laughs> <It's not more laughs> question. and that brings you to the second one which is then the collaboration tanks because now they aren't reaching out they aren't making a, uh, a noise they aren't making a stink they aren't like hey listen everybody I don't, I don't care what's happening right now everyone has to stop i'm having some major issues no as a junior or as a code school grad, uh, if this isn't been well developed, then they kind of just disappear. Like, yeah, I haven't heard from this guy in three, four days. They think it's not for them. Yes. It's more about them than the problem Absolutely. they're solving. But then that means that the collaboration goes down. Yeah. There's, there's not that much chat, chatter, chatter happening. Everything gets quiet. You're staring yeah. into the laptop. The only you... thing you can hear is everybody else typing on their computer, solving the world's hardest problems in your head. Yes. And you're just like, and I am like, definitely oh! the dumbest person in this room Absolutely. right now. And really, you just look over and they're on Facebook, right? Like, they're not actually even solving problems. It's yeah, kind so of I... all of this, like, illusion, imposter yeah. syndrome, yeah. all that kind of... And so it's my, um, you know, just to bring it back to, um, to again, my, my kids... Um, I often observe these, my, all my kids play soccer, and I, op I often observe how every single soccer practice is teaching children how to kick the ball, pass the ball, you know, stay in position, and all the tactics of soccer, right? Mm -hmm. But on game day, those kids are completely freaked out, don't know what to do. And I'm just, and I'm just realizing, and then 
parents and coaches and, and everybody yelling, run forward, kick the ball, pass the ball, just get, you know, wrong way, you know, and it's just, and now tactical coaching is happening from the side. But sure. meanwhile, none of those kids have been taught what it means when there are two teams on the field and what that means, what that says about you and your team or the, the whole team dynamic that happens. Now, I'm not saying it's an easy problem to solve, but that's something that n- is never getting coached. So did they all suddenly forget how to play soccer? No. But that part of their brain that remembers how to play soccer is completely drowned out by this big fat unknown which is i don't know what this means like scoring i mean oh when they score it's bad when i score it's good you know it's just a fascinating thing to observe and even with junior engineers going into jobs it's like tactically i can i know that if i start at position a i know that i can get to an app that resembles you know a b c d sure you can hack it together but when i'm in a team setting when I'm trying to achieve business goals, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm sort of inside of the, the, the real reason why they taught me all that stuff, now suddenly you're, you know, it's a blank. Yeah. It's like the saying, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the face, right? In boxing, right? Like it's, it's that moment where you're just like, oh man, what is happening? And so it's like the hardest thing to like get through because it's not that they don't, believe you but it just goes against their instinct to say like hey we're gonna do a collaborative exercise this morning and like so right now in the classroom magic afternoon is happening right right and so students will be like i have to finish this project i can't participate i refuse to do it and you're just like that's like well this is what's gonna help you get a job and they're like "No, no no they're so focused on chasing the soccer ball around right that like they won't listen yes, to the yes. coach of like, we are actually doing that. That's yes. why we have magic why? afternoon. That's <laughs> yes. why we're like companies actually do this to hire people like this exact exercise. And so it's like c- trying to help them get out of their own way of like, they think we're just making up, you know, this thing or I'm not sure completely what happens in the brain. Um, but it's more of like, no, 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 this is going to make you successful. It's like working with other people, getting through these problems um and you know ultimately that responsibility falls on us to set that expectation and like get them there that's like the challenge and the psychological part that i love that like drives me is like okay i must not have communicated clearly that this is super important otherwise they wouldn't have this resistance to this activity so it's kind of like our iteration is kind of like iterating on setting expectations holding them accountable and continually like moving down that pathway so not everybody's chasing the ball while like losing the overall goal of like we just lost the yes. game, right? No, that's uh, I don't know how this happened, but our time is up. Okay. I am a huge fan of the Origin Code Academy. I appreciate that. Thank you for changing people's Your actions show that as well, not just your words. So Thank I you. really appreciate that. And uh, best of luck to you and the team. And I'll probably have you on soon again. Sounds good. Here we go. Thanks, man. Have you chatted with the CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.